Bibles as we continue our study on a little brief, brief book called Haggai, or some call it Haggai. Haggai, we've already looked at chapter 1 in the book of Haggai. We're looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 in our time together today, and I pray that it will be edifying and a blessing. Out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God, chapter 2, Haggai, it's on page 1307 in my Bible. That may or may not help you at all. Chapter 2, the little small two-chapter, we're breaking it up into three messages. Today we'll look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, as I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture silently. In the seventh month of the one and the twentieth day of the month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, uh, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and, he, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and, the, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I uh, covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Thank you, and we may be seated. Perhaps some of you will recall in some of the days gone by, some of the things that you have seen or you have faced or that you have been involved in, Perhaps there's a number that's even under the sound of my voice today that you've experienced some things that as you look back on, you are discouraged. I believe someone said, and I will quote, discouragement is the greatest enemy for the believer. Discouragement is the greatest enemy for the believer. As you study the book, for example, of Nehemiah, you'll find the enemy's attack was through derision, deception, and discouragement. You recall in the book of Nehemiah, for example, in the fourth chapter, the right page, the left column, about halfway down in my Bible, they sent notices to uh, Nehemiah and the 49,942 workers that when you least expect it, we're going to come in and kill all of you. That brought about discouragement on the part of the people in carrying out the work. So also today, as we understand what we see in the text that is before us, discouragement perhaps has set in. When Nehemiah was faced with discouragement, he was able to win the victory and continue to work building the wall because he reminded the people, our God shall fight for us. Chapter 4, verse 20, our God shall fight for us. And the discouragement we see today in the lives and the hearts of so many, and it's the greatest tool that Satan could ever use in the life and the heart of the child of God, that is discouragement. Question that I ask, and you can ponder it, you need not say amen or oh me. How many of you have ever been discouraged? If you say, I've never been discouraged, we're going to talk about lying in the next message. Uh, as we think about discouragement, what brings it on? I've been fascinated with uh, one that it's sur uh, kind of surveyed uh, discouragement, not necessarily from a biblical perspective, but I've used uh, this little thought for quite some time. And he says four causes for discouragement, four causes for discouragement. Number one is fatigue, being exhausted and trying to get something done. And as a result of that, you're discouraged. Frustration, that's being overwhelmed with too many things to do and you can't seem to get them done. Have you ever been there? <laughs> I stay there. <laughs> Frustration, being overwhelmed. Failure, 
the plans and the projects and the possibilities that you're working on just seem to fall apart. Failure and a fear of failure. And a fear of failure is the last of the four causes, this writer says, for discouragement. Fear of criticism, fear of not being able to carry out the responsibility, fear of failure, and many times fear of the future of not being able to get those things done and what the future would hold. Now, perhaps one of those things touched on the area of that of discouragement that you have been faced with. Many people today are discouraged, defeated, living lives of uh, simply feeling hopeless, a sense of hopelessness in what is being done. And I think when we look at all that we see taking place in the world, especially when we look at what is happening in the Beltway in Washington, D.C., it's easy to become discouraged and hopeless, feeling, well, what can we do? Uh, I know a lot of people today that have gotten to the point in place, and uh, it is hopeless. There's nothing we can do. There's no reason to try to do anything. Just leave it alone. We cannot be any uh, help in, uh, in any way whatsoever. In this text that is before us, the people are discouraged. The people have become discouraged. We don't know exactly what they saw, but as you understand, 15 years had gone by and they had not uh, started the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, it's uh, now uh, been pushed by Haggai, challenging them to get ready, get involved, and start doing so. The foundation was laid, and now as the foundation is laid, and all we can do is look at it on a hypothetical basis. What did they see? that caused them to be discouraged. Uh, many of them, as we'll see in the text, uh, uh, Haggai is saying, how many of you lived uh, long enough that you remember Solomon's temple? How many of you perhaps worshiped there? How many of you remember what it looked like and the glory of it? I have con uh, concluded down through the years that perhaps they were looking at the foundation. They saw, man, gee, this is not as large as Solomon's temple at all. Uh, this is not what we expected. Uh, this is not the grand, will not be the grandeur and the greatness of Solomon's temple and got discouraged and simply uh, tossed in the trial and the uh, uh, hammer and the chisel and said, we're not going to work anymore. That was the problem. They'd gotten discouraged in what had taken place. They had just started like some 15 years uh, uh, previous in the task of rebuilding the temple. In this chapter, they had just become overcome with disinterest and discouragement in the task before them in rebuilding the temple. May I say, that seems to be the peril that undermines great work in the Christian life. Disinterest and discouragement. There's a need, I believe, today for courage and determination. And here we find Haggai, God's prophet, calls the people to be encouraged. He calls them uh, to be have courage. I call it the call for courage. It could simply be uh, be encouraged, to be challenged, to be encouraged. But I want us to notice three things in these nine short verses that I believe could be applied in our lives today and be a benefit and a blessing to us in doing so. Notice, first of all, the discouragement of the people recorded in verses 1, 2, and 3. Secondly, I want us to notice the directive of the prophet reminded in verses 4 and 5. The declaration of the uh, uh, prophetic revealed in verses 6 through 9. Notice the discouragement of the people in verses 1, 2, and 3. First of all, we see the circumstances reviewed. According to verse 1 and 2, according to the verses in 1 and 2 in this text, it's about 520 uh, B.C. It's in uh, October approximately. As best we can look at the calendar of the uh, Jewish custom of that day, the Jewish calendar. It's the seventh month, usually coinciding with the uh, parts of the uh, of September, October celebration. This would be the last day of the Feast of Tabernacle in celebration. Usually it's the time of rejoicing. Usually it's a time of thanksgiving for the harvest that's being brought in. But as you recall in chapter 1, there had been a famine of crop loss and difficulties and the people are faced with that difficulty and the loss and perhaps being disenchanted uh, with what they see in the foundation of the temple being laid. May I say to you, it's easy to become discouraged and that discouragement can bring about disinterest in carrying out the work that God has called us to. It's now been almost a month uh, since the people had begun the work. 
23 days, in fact, according to chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 21. About 23 days uh, from the time that uh, Nehemiah, uh, Haggai had called them to become encouraged and involved. And here he's challenging them to be encouraged and not discouraged with what they see. Notice the challenge recorded in that third verse. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Haggai is asking a very powerful question. Uh, he is challenging the people. He is challenging them to commitment. God has already challenged them to commitment in the first chapters we've seen for the work to be carried out. Uh, they were under God's curse for selfishness, and God has challenged them to consider their priorities in that first chapter as we have seen. Placing the priority of God and God's work as number one is the challenge that we saw in that text. And he says here, he's asking the question, who is left among you that saw the house, that is the temple, in her first glory? It is a powerful question that uh, Haggai is asking. Many of those present, I'm sure, could recall it. Perhaps it's by uh, hand-me-down conversation from relatives or family members, or perhaps some of them were in the group that was old enough that they had actually seen the glory of the temple, of Solomon's temple. Uh, you recall in Solomon's temple, as, you, as we have studied it and looked at it and considered the glory and the grandeur of it in relationship to what uh, Haggai is seeing here among the people, there's the mindset that it's not big, it's not good enough, it's not going to be grand enough. Just how do you see the temple in light of what you recall in the past is what Haggai is asking the people. Some scholars say that Solomon's temple would have been over $20 million in his day. God is saying here, compare the two. That's what he's saying through Haggai the prophet. Compare the two. Compare it. Now listen very carefully. Uh, throughout the study in this, uh, these few verses, we're going to look at uh, uh, the text in comparison to where we are today and what we see today in so much of our lives and so many people becoming so discouraged. We see the circumstances reviewed in verse 1 and 2. We see the challenge recorded in that third verse. But notice in that third verse also the comparison required. And how do you see it now? Haggai is asking them. Some of you recall that temple of old, the Solomon temple. Some of you uh, were able to live and see that. He says, is it not in your eyes in comparison? It is as nothing, as nothing. There are a lot of folks today in the Christian community that once they've been inoculated with bigness, regardless of the theological soundness, they cannot come down to a point in place where they are listening to sound doctrine being proclaimed and taught from the pulpits across the nation. Multitudes today, even as Christians, have the mindset that if it's big, it's better. In fact, I was disappointed with one of the writers a number of years ago it puts out the little daily bread booklet, and I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. But one of the writers had a uh, little booklet said, How to Find uh, a Good Church. How to Find a Good Church. That sounds pretty interesting when you read the cover. How to Find a Good Church. His thesis was, if you're new in the community, get in your car on Sunday morning, drive the neighborhoods, look at the churches, and the church that has the parking lot filled, that's the church you ought to be in. I threw the booklet away. <laughs> That's a wrong barometer to make the determination. You could go to a nightclub and find the parking lot full. Does that mean that everything is right that's taking place there? Not in your life. Here is Haggai. He's saying to the people that are disillusioned and discouraged, he's saying, what do you see in comparison to the bigness and the grandeur with what you see now? What do you see? How do you view it? How do you see that in your own eyes? May I say, uh, those that had seen Solomon's temple perhaps worship there. So the new temple is small as uh, not to grand and not the grandiose uh, temple that they had experienced. Uh, they perhaps compared it to when they saw Zerubbabel's temple and what was there as the farmhouse is compa in comparison. Uh, the older people with the heart sick over the size and the grandeur of the old building as they reflected back on it, they were disappointed, disillusioned, and even discouraged. In fact, in 
the little book of Ezra. You need not turn to it. But Ezra, the third chapter, I'm going to read a few verses in Ezra chapter 3. Now in the second year of the, uh, their coming into the house of God in Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel, Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, and the remnant of the brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all that were there come out of the captivity under Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Joshua with the son of his brethren, and it goes on to talk about what they're doing. Drop down to about verse 12. And many of the priests and the Levites and the chief and the fathers were who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, for that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of the joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted a loud shout, and a noise was heard afar off. When they saw what was taking place, there were shouts of joy from some, and there was moaning and groaning from others. That's my interpretation of the text. Uh, they just simply were dis disconcerted, disappointed, and delusional in relationship to what should be as they saw it. I think many times in our lives as Christians, we get discouraged because we think something ought to go the way we think it ought to go. There's a mindset that God is not uh, standing or God is not available in the small things, only in the grandeur and the great things. And there's a lot of flurry going on online today about a mega major church in America out of Texas where they've literally locked the doors and had what I call a knockdown drag out with thousands and thousands and thousands, and may I say again, thousands of people because of the rumor, maybe true or not, of homosexual relationship with the pastor. And as a result of that, there's disillusionment. In fact, online there are a number of rumblings and blogs taking place of the disillusionment and what it's caused in the hearts and the minds and the lives of multitudes of Christians that had placed their faith and trust and confidence in the greatness and the grandeur of what they were accustomed to seeing. May I say to you, we need to get back to the basics of what the Scripture says, place our faith and trust and confidence in the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God and not in some person or personage that has the high platform position of making it sound as though everything is grand and great because of the numbers. This is what we see in this text today. This is what has, uh, uh, Haggai is saying to the people as they look at it. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? It's easy to become discouraged when we look back on great revivals and compare it to the dearth of what we see today. It's easy to look back. In fact, I enjoy reading some of the uh, material about the sawdust trails of yesteryear, the gigantic tent revivals of yesteryear. Even just a few years back when it was possible to have a revival meeting, back the years that I was on the road in evangelism, we'd have eight services Sunday morning through Sunday morning. It was not unusual to find packed houses with the sanctuary getting uh, greater and greater in the fullness each and every night, each and every service, until it was packed out on Sunday morning. Very, very few churches today have what is traditionally called revival services simply because the Christians are looking for greatness and grandeur rather than hearing the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God proclaimed from the pulpit. So often our uh, visible and verbal discouragement can cause others to become discouraged also. Discouragement is contagious among those that you're around if you're discouraged. In essence, discouragement is a lack of faith in the power of God to provide what his word has promised us that he'll do. Solomon's temple with its precious metals and stones and uh, so forth was one of the wonders of the world in that era. But when they compared it to what they were building, they were discouraged. It was not what they thought it should be at all. May I say, when you look at some of the text in relationship to it, in Zechariah, the fourth chapter, verse 8 and following, I'll read these words. More of the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, 
the hands of Zerubbabel has laid the foundation of the house. His hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel, who's, uh, those seven that the days, the eyes of the Lord, which run to and for, forth through the whole earth. Notice that, go back to that. For who hath despised the day of small things? May I say to you, I believe we're there today. I believe there's a mindset, if it's small, it's bad. If it's small, it's not worth going. There are a number of people. I'll never forget a number of years ago, had a man and his wife that had his kids in the academy, and they uh, moved their membership to our fellowship. One Wednesday, uh, sitting here in the sanctuary, having testament, testimonial time, and he stood, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, we've been in Jacksonville five years. We've been looking for the right thing in the wrong places for five years. We found it here. May I say the mindset is among Christians, it ought not to be among Christians where the mindset says that if there's the great brass band, if there's the great uh, sound and the parking lot full and everything is going, most people in that setting cannot tell you who they're seated next to in a worship service. In fact, some churches are so large they break it up by zip code and you live in a certain zip code and that's you're known by your zip code rather than by your first name. <laughs> I find it amazing that we've devolved to that. I recall a pastor sending me his resume. I preached a revival meeting in his church up in Forest Park, Georgia and got back to Jacksonville and a couple of two or three days later he had his five-page resume in an envelope. He said, if you are in a position where you see other churches looking for a pastor, pass this on. I'd love to make a move. A little P.S. footnote at the bottom. I'm not looking for the smaller situation. <laughs> Somehow, some way, we have devolved to that place and position in all that we do today in our Christian life. Most Christians today look down on small churches with uh, no uh, uh, grandeur, uh, with no great band, uh, with no renowned recognition, and they look down on it as though that is not uh, worthwhile. And that's exactly what uh, has, uh, Haggai is dealing with here in relationship to the new temple that's being built, Zerubbabel's temple, as it came to be known in comparison to Solomon's temple. Let me just give you a little illustration that's meant much, much to me down through the years. It's the story of a preacher in Scotland, a real story, resigned because he was discouraged. And he said, and I quote, we haven't had but one conversion this entire year. That conversion was little Bobby Moffat. Listen to the rest of the story. Little did he realize that little Bobby Moffat would become Robert Moffat, the great missionary to Africa, who was responsible for opening Africa with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was the father-in-law of David Livingston and the first translator of the Bible into the dialect for the African people of that era. Little things, small things mean a lot to God. They may not to us. We as Christians ought not to look at it on that basis. Discouragement can cause one to give up on what God has called him to do. Discouragement, some people, uh, one person said, many people quit just around the corner from success in completing what God had called them to do. Let me say this to us today. Wherever you are, whatever God's, wherever God's planted you, serve him there with the greatest effort, the greatest ability, the greatest tools that God's ever given you. Use it and honor him with the gifts, talents, and abilities that he's given you to do so. There ought not to be any such thing as quitting on God. Or not to be any such thing as being discouraged because we don't see what God is doing many times. I can tell you it's easy to get discouraged. Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. <laughs> Somebody said, Pastor, do you ever want to quit? I said, yes, every Monday morning. <laughs> we need to recognize that God is still at work whether we see him doing the work or not. God is still on the throne. Many times... Some things, some churches will put together committees so they can get something done. Anybody ever wondered what a committee really is? I've written it down so I won't forget. 
A committee is a group of incompetent appointed, incompetents appointed by the indifferent to do the unnecessary. <laughs> Many times if you want to get something dead in the water, just turn it over to a committee. I don't like committees. I don't like boards. You know, the board of deacons. Sounds like they have some authority, doesn't it? May I say to you that God's called us to serve him, to honor him, submit and surrender our lives under his lordship. And he's called us to wait on him, to walk and allow him to lead the way, illumine our pathway. And that's through the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. Not only do we see the discouragement of the people recorded in verse 1, 2, and 3, but notice the directive of the prophet reminded in verse 4 and 5. Notice the command recited there in that fourth verse. Yet now, notice the challenge. He's already talked with them basically. What do you see? Do you see uh, something small or something that God is in? What do you see? How do you view it? Then he says, yet now, at this moment now, not tomorrow, now, not next week, now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people. Notice that one verse, be strong, is stated three times. You would think that he means it, don't you? Wouldn't you? <laughs> be strong. That means to be encouraged. All ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. Be encouraged and carry out the work. Be encouraged to do what God's called you to do. Notice here in that be strong three times. He's speaking to the politicians. He's speaking to the priests. He's speaking to the people. He's saying to each one of them, be strong, be encouraged, and carry out the work that I've called you to do. I just made a little more of a note. Wow. God was not impressed with their concerns, and he was not impressed with their criticism. He was encouraging them and challenging them for courage to stand up and carry out the work. He commands that they be strong. That means to be courageous when you look at the text. It takes courage to serve the Lord today. It takes courage for the Christians to get up every morning and stand for Jesus Christ when going to work. It takes courage today for the child of God to say, I'm not going to go the way the world is going. It takes courage to say, I'm not going to be involved in your little gossip section. It takes courage to say, I'm not going to let my mouth be a gutter and a sewer for society today. It takes courage for the child of God in the work day world and the professional world to take the stand for Jesus Christ. It takes courage to say, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you call me. I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Amen. I believe it's time Christians stand up and be encouraged and carry out the work that God's called us to. He commands that they be strong, be courageous, and it takes that courage. It takes the courage today when the Christian is under assault by the media and the politicians and the correctness and the woke society. It takes courage today for the Christian to stand and say, I'm not going to go along with the crowd and the Communist Network news. It takes courage to say, I believe in the word of God regardless of what happens in the world. It takes courage. In this verse, God is saying, be strong three times. He calls on us, us to be encouraged and to be in uh, full commitment in serving him. Notice the text doesn't say be encouraged and take courage and be courageous and stop. It says be courageous and work. That's a dirty four-letter word. <laughs> He is saying, get to work and stop, stop being uh, amused, uh, uh, bemused by yourself and what you thought it ought to be and what you thought it could be. Many times in our lives, we conjure up what we think a church ought to be like, what the services ought to be like, and what ought to be said. I've said for many years, I believe the church is amiss with the, uh, they're trying to have some kind of program for everybody to keep you going 24-7 back to the church, back to the church with a meeting and a meeting and another meeting. I believe the word of God ought to come from the pulpit and not from a place where somebody's having a private secret Bible study where everybody has an opinion, everybody has their thought, and nobody's there to arbitrate the truth from the word of God. It's so seed of discord, disinterest, and discouragement in the household of faith. A number of years ago, so, someone visiting said, well, uh, why doesn't your church have a Thursday morning Bible study? 
Ma'am, that's what Sunday school's about, Bible study. <laughs> Not on Thursday morning. Nothing wrong with that if you want to do so. But if you're doing that outside the realm of the household of faith, Sunday morning in worship and Sunday school, Bible study, where we can get together, study the Word of God, and uniquely have those cell sessions so we can discuss the Scripture one-on-one. -on -one. That guy's saying, be encouraged, be strong. No time to complain, no time to bellyache, no time to look back at the past, no time to wonder what it could have been like if something had happened this way or that way or the other. Most of the time, Christians want to look back and say, I've been guilty of it. You know, look at the good old days. Look what it used to be like. Look what it was like. Well, what are you doing today for the gospel of Jesus Christ? What are we doing today that we might uh, multiply the faith? What are we doing today that we might reach the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Multitudes of Christians today, we get all excited if you talk about a uh, uh, trip someplace around the world to carry out missions and you're not doing anything in your own backyard or next door neighbors. Never will forget a number of years ago. In fact, it was back in the early 70s. A traveling evangelist said in one of his messages, he said, don't tell me about sending your kids to our community in Pennsylvania to evangelize there if you're not doing it here in this church. The apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting, that means that the memory is not there as you study that text. It means do not allow the past to prevent you from doing what God's called you to do in the present. Don't allow the past successes weight you down that you're unwilling to do what God's called you to do today. Don't let the past failures hamper you and hamstring you that you cannot be released by faith to do what God's called you to do in the here and now. So many people get caught up with, well, the church I used to be in or the place I used to live or the ministry that I used to have, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing today for Jesus Christ? We need to be encouraged and challenged afresh and anew to honor God with all that he gives us with the gifts, talents, and abilities to serve him in a surrendered life. I just made a little marginal note. We must look forward. We must not slow down. We cannot be sidetracked. We will not, should not be discouraged. God is still at work in us to, and has work for us to do. Reaching the lost, we plan on this and we plan on that and we plan on the other. That's all right to make the plans, but God ought to be in the plans and we ought to be carrying out and motivated to carry out the task that he's called us to do in that. What could we do here and now in this church, in this community, if we'd stop being discouraged and stop looking back and stop looking at what others are doing and focus on what God's called us to do here and now in serving him and reaching this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe we need to focus on the present, not looking back at the past. We must minister for the master's sake with the strength that God has given us. Satan will tell you that uh, what you're doing for the Lord is small. What you're doing for the Lord is unimportant. What you're doing for the Lord is worthless. But God says, be strong, have courage, and never, 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 ever quit in serving him. You'd be surprised how many times I have worked with people. So preacher, you know, back years ago, I used to teach Sunday school class. Back years ago, I was a deacon. Back years ago, I was a, a bivocational a lay evangelist. Back years ago, I did. What are you doing now for the gospel of Jesus Christ? We need to be encouraged and not discouraged because God is still on the throne. God is still using us today if we'd simply submit and surrender our lives to him as that old song says, take my life and let it be only always used for thee. That's what God's wanting today out of your life and out of my life is surrender. The command recited, but notice the commitment reassured. Verse 4, the latter portion in verse 5. For I am with you. How can we be encouraged? Why should we be challenged to be encouraged? Why should we be challenged to be encouraged with all that God's called us to do? For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. 
Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. <laughs> God's saying, get up and get to work, boy. God's saying, get up and get to work, Al. God is saying, don't you dare be afraid to step out and to carry out the task that I've called you to do. Fear of failure causes most never to get started on a task for the Lord. Fear of failure. God says, you can have courage because of my commitment to be with you. I just made a note. Hey, we are never, ever alone when we serve the Lord. He is there. He's the one that gives the strength. He's the one that gives the ability. He's the one that gives the courage first to carry out the task he's called us to do. What has he called you to do? Ponder that. What are you doing today? Not what you did yesterday, last month, last year, or 10 years ago. What are you doing today for the gospel of Jesus Christ? What are you doing today in the life and the work of the local New Testament church? What are you doing now to promulgate the gospel? What are you doing today to reach others with the truth of the word of God? What are you doing today for evangelism and outreach to impact lives for eternity? God says through Haggai, I am with you. There's never a time, never a moment, never a day, never a place that we're alone. Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit of God, is ever present in your heart and mine if we've said yes to him as Savior and as Lord. Never a time that we're alone. Never an opportunity that we're alone and we're to be discouraged and depressed because of the circumstances that we cannot control. God is with us. God's making that promise here. He's the one that gives the courage. He's the one that provides the ability. Remember, the Lord is with us. Whatever we do, wherever we go, it is God through the Holy Spirit that is our strength and our comfort. And God reminds them here of his commitment that when we are doing what he's called us to do, he's present and with us. He reminds them of that commitment when they left Egyptian bondage. In fact, a text that is fitting, I believe, found in Joshua, the first chapter, the fifth verse and following. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee, that is to prevent or to stand and block what you're doing. This shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I would be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all notice, all of the law which Moses my servant commanded ye. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper, that is, uhodas, have a good journey, wheresoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest do observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, then when? When you meditate on the word day and night. Then when? When you obey what the scripture says. And then, the scripture says, thou shalt make thy way prosperous that is successful for the Lord thy God and give thee success. Verse 9 of Joshua chapter 1, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That's the same promise that God's making here through Haggai the prophet to the people that's discouraged with what they see in the small foundation for Zerubbabel's temple in comparison to what they were familiar with with Solomon's temple. Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Dr. Adrian Rogers said a number of years ago, he's with the Lord now, but a number of years ago he said, it's dark, but it's gloriously dark. 
Jesus Christ could come at any moment. <laughs> we should recognize it's dark, but it's gloriously dark. We should be planning and preparing for the next thousand years, but be ready in the next 30 seconds to go on to be with the Lord. The rapture of the church is the next thing on God's calendar, and we need to recognize and be ready to meet him. The psalmist said, and may I remind us, the Lord is my shepherd. I will fear no evil. The Lord by the way, it's an interesting study because in the Hebrew text, the word is is not there. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, it's a declarative statement. The Lord, my shepherd, my shepherd. <laughs> and that ought to be our mantra today, that whatever he's called us to do, wherever he's called us to go, whatever he has assigned us to do in ministry and responsibility in sharing the good news of the gospel, that he is with us and there shall be a, never be a moment that he's not present with us to carry it out. The discouragement of the people recorded. The directive of the prophet reminded. But notice in verse 6, 7, 8, and 9, the declaration of the prophet revealed. Notice, first of all, the control reminded in verse 6 and 7. Let's read that together. Verse 6 and 7. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice what he's saying. God is reminding the people, the politicians, and the priest. He's reminding them all that he's in control. That sixth verse, God is saying, I'm in control over all of nature. All of nature. God reminds us that he is in control now and in the future. And notice in that text what he's reminding them. It is taking a leap forward with what's going to take place in relationship to that day that is called the day of tribulation. God is saying, I'm in control of all of nature and what I will carry out and what I will do. In fact, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 and following, the scripture reads this way. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell under the earth even as a fig tree catcheth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings and the earth, kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and the mountains and said unto the mountains, and the rocks fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the Lamb uh, and the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Here in this text, God is saying, I'm the one that's in control. I'm in control of all of nature. It is God pointing to that second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the day of judgment in the final wrap-up of this old world. By the way, some believe that the Christian will go through the tribulation. I've got a beautiful library at home, about 13,000 volumes. A man that worked for us in the college for a number of years until we found out that he couldn't leave Calvinism out of the classroom. And we had to ask him to find something else. But he always admired the library. And I said, I tell you what, when the rapture comes, you can have it. <laughs> He thinks he'll be here and going through the tribulation. I'm thankful that when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, he took upon himself the wrath, the wrath of God. For your sins and for my sins, they were all laid on Jesus Christ. God's not angry with the sinner, with the saved, uh, the saved person, but with the one that's lost. All of our sins have been mitigated, covered by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. The word wrath is the word thumos, the white hot anger of God. God's anger will be poured out on a Christ-rejecting, God-hating, Bible-denying society when the rapture of the church takes place. And I won't be here, and I'm thankful for that. This text 
Haggai, God's prophet, God's mouthpiece, God's preacher, is reminding the people that God is in control of all of nature. In fact, in this same chapter, in verse 21 and 22, we'll read these words. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. God is saying, I'm in control of all of nature. May I say to you, God also says, I'm in control of all the nations. I'm in control of all the nations. In fact, let me read, go back and read a couple of texts that I believe is fitting. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, the scripture says, For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 and 30, we read these words. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels, angelos messengers, with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together the, his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. May I say to you, God is saying, I'm in control of nature. I'm in control of the nations in, that, in the seventh verse in this text. We looked at a moment ago. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill the house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. He's going to shake the people, the scripture saying. I believe that we are living in an era, if I can do a little parenthetical footnote. I believe we're living in an era today that God is saying, I want to get your attention. God is saying, I'm going to get your attention one way or the other. God is saying, I'm going to get your attention if it's in by way of financial collapse. I'm going to get your attention if it's by hurricanes and storms and uh, it's not El Nino. It's not uh, climate change. It's God's hand that's in control of all. But God is saying, I'm in control of every nation. And he says, I'm going to shake it. This is God's prophecy for that coming day of the tribulation when he will pour out his wrath, his white hot anger on a Christ-rejecting, God-hating, Bible-denying society. Remember, God's calling people today. He's pointing them out. And he is one that's in control and he's saying, I am in control. He's in control of both now and all the future. God is in control. You see, one of the things that I perceive that's taking place, even among Christians today, there seems to be the mindset, I make my own destiny. I determine what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go, and how long we're going to stay. It's not a matter of saying, God, I recognize your word tells me that life is as a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. So therefore, God, Lord willing, this is what I'm going to do today. Lord willing, this is what I'll do tomorrow. Lord willing, in fact, in the little book of James, it reminds us that ought to be what we say and how we ought to uh, carry out our lives. And it's Lord's, the Lord's will today that we be actively involved in serving him and not discouraged or disillusioned because of what's happening in the world and the circumstances around us. Yes, we have witnessed lawfare today as never seen in the 246 plus years of American history. We witness today the destruction of our constitutional republic. We're witnessing today the undermining, the tearing down and destroying of the morals and ethics and the values as never before seen in our nation. We're witnessing today the secularization of America. We're witnessing today a post-Christian era in our nation. But that ought not to disillusion us, discourage us, and cause us to be disinterested in carrying out the work that God's called us to do. It should motivate us even more so when we see these things coming about. Luke chapter 21, verse 25 and following. Verse 28 is the key. It lists the things that will be happening in the days of the tribulation and leading up to it, the signs. It says, we'll see these things coming about. Look up, lift up your head, for our redemption draweth nigh. It's getting closer every day, every moment that we live. It is getting closer and closer. We ought not to be discouraged, but encouraged and challenged, afresh and anew. Be strong and of good courage, because I am with you. 
God is reminding us in this text that is before us today. He says, I will fill this house with my glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Did you read that? Did you see that? Who's going to fill this house? Me and you? No. God says, I'm going to do it. Our responsibility is to go tell. The responsibility of reaping the harvest is God's. We're to sow the seed. We're to water. But God is going to do the harvesting. Not me, not you, not any church, not any denomination. And when there's the brag about 14,000 being baptized on the east left coast, a bunch of churches got together and had a contest. Who can baptize the largest number? They were shooting for 100,000 baptisms. Baptism doesn't wash away a single sin. Baptism doesn't save an individual from hell. You can baptize the person until you wash him till his skin's gone. Won't make an ounce of difference in his relationship to Jesus Christ. When it comes to that aura, my mindset, my uh, uh, statements have been, wait 90 days and see how many got saved, how many walked down an aisle in some local New Testament church and said, Lord, take my life. Let me serve you and honor you. Baptism comes after salvation, not a precursor to salvation. Baptism is the outward show of what has changed in the heart of an individual. And yet some way there's the mindset today that these churches can put on the big show of who's going to baptize the largest number. The apostle Paul says, and I'm going to give you the young blood vernacular. He said, I don't know how many I baptized, who they were. I never counted them. Yet some way there's the mindset today we're going to have a showmanship of who can baptize the most. There are a lot of our younger people today, the uh, millennial age group, 18 to 35 year old age group, that that is a whole lot of aura that is out there today. And yet that same age group says there's no such thing as absolute truth. They're denying the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God as being the sole absolute truth. Their statement in the latest survey says that each and every individual has their own version of truth. Half truth is a whole lie. And yet we have those today that believe that somehow, some way, they can carry out the life the way they want to. God says, I will fill this house with my glory. Uh, This points to the Lord Jesus Christ and his reign from the temple in Jerusalem during the millennial reign. This shows that the people ought to be encouraged and challenged as salt and light to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives and living. We see the control reminded, but I want you to notice in closing, in verses 8 and 9, the comfort revealed, the comfort revealed. Notice what the text says. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice, first of all, God is owner of it all. God's owner of it all. He says, I own the silver and the gold. I own it all. It's not yours. It's on loan from God. Whatever we have in our pockets, whatever we have in our gifts, talents, and abilities, it's not ours. It's on loan from God. It's to be used for his honor and for his glory. It's to be surrendered to him. God says, hey, look, listen, I count it all. I own it all. Whatever you need, whatever you have, whatever you think you have, I have it under control. It's mine. Perhaps the people were concerned with having enough to build the temple. I don't know, but God reminds them I've got it all. I own the gold. I own the silver. As Dr. S.M. Lockridge used to say, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he doesn't have to put a laundry mark on them. <laughs> God owns it all. And he's reminding the people here in this text, I own it all. Whatever God calls us to do, he's going to provide the resources to carry it out. That's what he's saying. God's saying to them, don't worry about the size of the temple. I own it all. And he says, this is going to be greater and grander than the former. And he's pointing to, as you study the text, he's pointing to that ultimate temple that shall be built. 
Ezekiel chapter 40 through chapter 46. Wonderful study for the millennial temple. Gives the plans and specifications to the nth degree for it to be built. I'm told that the Temple Mount movement in Jerusalem already have the blueprints ready. They say that the building can be totally built and completed in less than 24 months. They're training the temple priest. They already have made the temple implements and utensils. The temple garments for the priest have already been created and made. They're waiting and ready and anxious for that opportunity to start building the temple on the temple mount in Jerusalem. And I pray every day, God, let one of those scud missiles from Iran be off course and clean the temple mount so that that can start the movement. When that happens, ladies and gentlemen, listen, the end is near when Jesus Christ will be calling the church out and having the 1,000 year, what is called the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever God calls us to do, we need not sit back and wonder how we're going to do it. What are we going to do? How are we going to get that accomplished? God's already promised he's going to do it through us. Listen to what some of the scripture says. Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Joshua 1, 9, I read that a moment ago. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Courage and courageousness is what is needed today. What is courage and courageousness from a biblical standpoint? And I made a note of this. It's to have an inner strength that enables us to confront danger, difficulties, discouragement without fear, with calmness, with boldness, with confidence, which is possible only for those that know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Are you afraid today? God's not given us a spirit of fear. Second Timothy chapter 1, 7 says, God calls us to be courageous and to be strong. Notice finally in verse 9, the glory of this latter house, that is the temple that they're now building and its successor temple shall be greater than the former, that is greater than the Solomon's temple, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place, in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. He didn't say in another place or another location. And I say that simply because there are a lot of biblical scholars today that say that the new temple, millennial temple, can be built right next to the Islamic mosque and still be on the Temple Mount. No, it can't. There's some that say it can be built in another location and it would be the same as building it on the Temple Mount. No, it won't. It will be right where Solomon's temple was, right where Zerubbabel's temple was. That will be the place that will be the new temple, the millennial temple shall be built there. And God says, listen, it's going to have a greater glory than the temple in the past, the Solomon's temple. Their labor, he's saying, your labor is not for naught. He reminds us that the future glory, when he shall be seated on his throne, is that day that they need to look forward to and not looking back. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4 and 5 says this, And his feet shall stand, that's talking about the feet of Jesus, that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, shall toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and the other half toward the south. Notice in the fifth verse we're in, Zechariah, the 14th chapter. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall uh, reach Aziel. Yea, ye shall flee like ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord, my God, shall come, and all the saints with thee. When Jesus Christ comes back, his feet's going to touch on the Mount of Olives. The Bible says that the Mount of Olives is going to clave, that is split. A valley will cross the uh, valley right outside of the temple, right outside the walls. That gate today is called the Golden Gate. That gate today is sealed up, and it was sealed up by the Islamics in the 6th century. That gate today is closed. There's an Islamic jihadist cemetery to prevent people from traversing. But when Jesus Christ comes, that temple, that eastern gate will be opened I say, open the gate, 
Jesus Christ is coming. And when he comes, and as I call it, landing on the Mount of Olives, there'll be a valley formed for him to walk straight into and be seated on his throne to rule and reign for a thousand years. Are you ready? Are you discouraged today? Let me encourage you to say we need to look up, lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. We need to recognize that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And the scripture here is very, very clear. God is calling us to courage. He's assuring us that the ultimate success is seen in the rule and reign of Jesus Christ where there will be the future joy and the future peace where they will be able to see, we will be able to serve him day and night. Day and night, serving him as king of kings and lord of lords. It's the call for courage. We need to be encouraged today. We understand what we have in the lordship of Jesus Christ. We understand what God is saying and what God is doing. The big picture is what we need to look at. Not focusing on me, myself, and I. What's the big picture for you and for me? What's the takeaway from the message today? We need to be encouraged, and in that encouragement, we need to be involved. Not looking back at what used to be, not looking back at what was, not looking back at the grandeur and the greatness of what we have done and perhaps have had success in doing, but what God is doing now. Each one being the piece of the puzzle of the work of the ministry in the life of the local New Testament church. Are we placing our lives forming that picture of what God would have done in the society in which we're living today. I challenge you to be encouraged. My bride said on several occasions, verbalizing it, do you ever get discouraged? Do you ever want to quit? <laughs> it's a fleeting thought every now and then. <laughs> but I'm challenged when I see what God has done, what God is doing, and what God can do as we allow him to work through our lives in building his kingdom, the kingdom of God.